Good evening, everyone, and thank you all so much for joining us tonight from all over the world. My name is Abigail DeKosnick, and I am the director of the Berkeley Center for New Media, which we call BCNM, and an associate professor at UC Berkeley in the Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies, and in BCNM. Just so you know what's behind me, uh, BCNM is hosting an ongoing lecture series this academic year called Indigenous Technologies. This is our logo for that series behind me, and you can learn more about that at our website bcnm.berkeley.edu. It is my great pleasure to introduce the phenomenal artist Lawrence Leck, but first uh, please allow me to introduce uh, the Berkeley Center for New Media and the Art, Technology, and Culture Colloquium of, this, this, of which this evening is a part. Uh, the Berkeley Center for New Media is an interdisciplinary research center that studies and shapes media transition and emergence from diverse perspectives. We recognize that BCNM is located in the territory of Huchin, the ancestral and unceded lands of Chechenyo speaking Ohlone peoples, specifically the confederated villages of Lashan. The history of prolific technological development in this region has always depended on this land and all of our technological infrastructures and activities take place on and in relation to this land. We commit to supporting the sovereignty and ongoing stewardship of this place by Ohlone peoples through building long-term reciprocity and relationships with tribal leaders and organizations. The Art, Technology, and Culture Colloquium, or ATC, was founded by Professor Ken Goldberg in 1997. ATC is an internationally respected forum for creative ideas. Always free of charge and open to the public, the series is coordinated by BCNM and has presented over 200 leading artists, writers, and critical thinkers. This series is supported by the Office of Berkeley Arts and Design, a campus initiative that connects and fortifies the creative units through the Berkeley campus and in Bay Area regional collaboration. A plus D co-curates a range of public lecture series, including A plus D Mondays every Monday evening in collaboration with many departments and centers on campus. Funds for these projects are made possible by A plus D and by generous philanthropic donation. Tonight's event is also co-sponsored by the Arts Research Center and the Department of Art Practice, and we express our deepest thanks to all of our funders. And now I am thrilled to introduce tonight's speaker. Lauren Sleck is a London-based artist, filmmaker, and musician who unifies diverse practices, CGI, audiovisual performance, gaming, and fiction into a continuously expanding cinematic universe. Drawing from a background in architecture and electronic music, he produces simulations of real places within future scenarios and alternate geopolitical histories. These worlds are populated with characters who want to be creators, surveillance satellites, digital sculptors, pop singers, all searching for autonomy under uncertain conditions of existence. Truth is entangled with fantasy. There is no clear divide between the human and the machine or between the real and the virtual. I became a huge fan of Lawrence Lex through watching his films, Sinofuturism, 1839 to 2046 AD, from 2016, Geomancer from 2017, and Adol from 2019. In fact, the first time I saw Geomancer exhibited at the CTM Festival in Berlin in 2018, my partner and I watched it again and again and went back on a second day to watch it one more time before leaving the city because it was so technically brilliant and conceptually enthralling. I was also thrilled to see these pieces exhibited at the Garage Museum of Contemporary Art in Moscow. And let me remind everyone who lives in the San Francisco Bay Area that you can see Lawrence Leck's thrilling work at the De Young Museum in Golden Gate Park right now through June of next year. So please make that a priority for your next art field trip. Lutz's recent solo exhibitions have been at the Cursor Gallery at the Center for Contemporary Arts in Prague, the HEK House of Electronic Arts Basel in Basel, Switzerland, Sadie Cole's HQ in London, and the Storm Den Haag in The Hague, Netherlands. It has been a dream of mine for a couple of years now to invite this world-renowned artist to talk about his work to us in the Berkeley Center for New Media. So I am extremely excited and happy to welcome Lawrence Leck. Wow, uh, 
Uh, thanks, Gail. Thanks for that really amazing introduction. Uh, hi from London. It is uh, the very late night here, so if what I say is inconsistent or kind of confusing, you can always leave comments in the Zoom section and I'll try and reply to them later. So um, it's always a bit strange talking in the echo chamber that is Zoom. So for that, I've decided to share my screen where I can talk about some of the videos that I've been working on. So um, when I got the invitation, I was kind of not really sure what to talk about because like, uh, I feel the universe that my work is within kind of intersects between many different areas. Um, like, like Gail was saying, really one of the unifying th things about it really is this idea about place or environment and the idea of um, maybe like futurity and the present and honestly, what difference does that make where we are today? So I come from a background in training in architecture and electronic music and I always thought of them as kind of two divergent poles really. In a sense, architecture is something that's purely about composition in terms of the art form. It's about set design, the setting the stage, I guess, for like real world events to happen, I suppose. That's the whole modus operandi of the, of the, of the field. And I guess electronic music and kind of live music where composition plays a really important part, but when you are actually performing, you are actually operating in real time. And so of course, you know, coming from the generation I do, um, video games, uh, animation, science fiction are kind of part of the consumer culture I grew up with. So a lot of these interests are really about as organic as I can, as I can make them. And so in a sense, what I'm interested in trying to create is, you know, drawing from this idea of, I guess, cinematic world building and so on, which on, you know, on the one hand, it's like something completely commercial. You have, you know, Marvel Cinematic Universe, you have a kind of um, commercial film and now streaming industry that's built upon this never ending serialization of content um, before, you know, you get into um, social, social media and so on. But my interest in building this kind of universe is I suppose from, from two different angles. One is to kind of challenge the idea of content production as something that is something uh, completely driven by, you know, algorithmic control, digital distribution and replication. To think of, is there some way that over a long, longer period of time, is it, is it possible to build something, I guess, more ambitious than that or something more interesting? So when I kind of witness my friends who are writers, you know, no one's asking anyone to write a novel. Um, they're asking for like 500 words by Tuesday morning. When I think about my friends who are CGI, uh, computer graphics animators, no one's asking them to make a, you know, a series or a film. It's always like 60 second clips for um, products on, on social media. And of course, there's nothing inherently wrong with this kind of commercialization or prosumer uh, bent towards creative production. I think it's a really interesting thing. But for me in my practice, as I try and balance like earning a living with kind of sponsored or commercial um, projects or commissions, it's really important to think about how these are going to like tie up in a wider time frame. The project I have, which I'm going to show in the uh, on screen at the moment, this is going to get a little bit meta, is a project called Bonus Levels. Um, and so this is the kind of website in bonuslevels.net. You can go there right now if you're bored or you want to do something else. And this ties together nine different projects when I first started making virtual worlds in um, 2013. So essentially what happened is, you know, I was always interested in making videos and music. And when I finished my kind of um, postgraduate studies in architecture, you know, some of my friends were talking, telling me about different world building ideas. You know, I had a friend who had an electronic music label called Quantum Natives, who have a, a Google website, which is essentially Google Maps, but the whole uh, music label and the whole back catalog is essentially given on this interface. Um, so I thought, what if instead of thinking of these virtual worlds that I'm building as just like a kind of standalone event or like for one exhibition, I actually thought of building them into a, into a kind of island. So these different um, 
these different so-called chapters of this bonus levels project, which in a, in a sense, I'm still working on now, still ongoing, but this particular one, so it's the collective tower. It's the first one I ever made. And it was for an art festival called Art Licks Weekend. And you can see how like, you know, primitive and blocky the, um, the, uh, the graphics are. But for me, the idea was I wanted to make a project, not so much about my own work, but to show the other installations that were taking as part of this festival, which was an artist run festival in lots of kind of independent project spaces in London. So I think I went to about um, maybe, what is it like 20 of these spaces. And of course, many of them no longer exist because they're kind of extremely precarious locations. And I kind of like talked to the artists and curators taking part and I mapped out a little bit of the exhibition so that this virtual project, which actually I think, yeah, you can kind of still download and play it here, um, would actually be like an archive, like a document of the physical space. So whereas, of course, most, um, you know, in terms of aesthetic discourse, there's this kind of very often this question between the virtual and the real space and which one is more kind of, of primacy and primary importance. I kind of thought that the uh, irony with a lot of uh, temporary projects is that the virtual can kind of outlast the physical manifestations of the place. So between this and many other different um, site specific installations, I kept on playing with this idea of essentially what does, what does site specific mean in, you know, I guess the 21st century, because in, in, in architecture, I guess I was really interested in uh, this idea of you know, we, you have a kind of modernist, generic, repli replicable um, space, you know, Ikea, airports, non-places, and this kind of thing. But how could you actually make the virtual world more site-specific? Um, and does that even, you know, and of course it obeys different kind of ideas in space and time. So one of the other projects in bonus levels is called Skyline. And for Skyline, it was for the next year of this uh, Art Lakes Weekend Festival in which I kind of made a, uh, a, a, tr a tube line basically that connects five different islands, um, each of which have a different collection of these art spaces. And it's kind of like suspended above London. You can kind of see there's different landmarks dotted around the place. So my idea for this was kind of extending different, you know, things I've been thinking about, but essentially thinking what if, you know, usually there's, ideas like you know the art world the film world and so on but instead of that what if we kind of took all of the elements from real life and actually use those as a kind of samples or fragments from that from that world and actually based on this project skyline it was the first time it actually put together essentially kind of like a cinematic trailer for the virtual world so i made the video game you could play it with an xbox controller and so on um, maybe I'll just show that here. So you could explore the virtual world with a video game controller, but the um, the um, way that that would be documented would be uh, would be as a kind of video trailer. So previously with architecture, I'd also tried to make, I guess, this wooden pavilion here, which is kind of like an otherworldly fantasy space within the real world. And in Skyline, it formed, and some of my other projects, it forms an actual like teleporter where you can go between different locations. And so this project, I guess, was a little bit of a turning point where I started thinking of, um, I guess, more directly cinematic ways of talking about different narratives that are already embedded within the project. So I'm just gonna play the first bit of the trailer from here, um, which has many different, you know, cinematic references and is made through this kind of collage, collage medium. I 
竟唔記得上咗呢架車幾耐，我開始覺得好奇怪。So in this in this kind of clip, what was happening is you know essentially I'm going from a journey from one station to another.、Um, the voiceover is from,、um, if I remember correctly, it's from 2046. Wang Kawai is 2046, and they're talking about a third location within the space of the film as well. So. Just like I'm interested in this,、um, I guess what does site-specific mean in this in this particular medium? I'm also really interested in how does a kind of、um, you know this hall of mirrors effect work in a virtual world, which is, I guess, in my opinion, essentially like a collage medium because you can have so many fragments of reality that it acts as a kind of not just archive for events and places that have. Been before in the past, but there's also different ways of kind of embodying things I'm interested in at the time as well. So I guess in this phase of kind of bonus levels, essentially, it was really looking at you know this idea of the you know I guess the analogy would be like you know the digital nomad or the wander through these different territories and spaces. But after a while. I started coming up against, you know, certain limitations with a certain way of working. One of them was really interesting: is that I found that when you're working for a specific event in mind, which obviously happens quite a lot with art commissions, with exhibitions and biennials, you can get kind of limited to responding to the、um, to the here and now, if that makes sense. So I'd also realized that I came from a kind of,、um, you know,、uh, paradigm where being Doing something really specific to a location is really important. So after doing, you know, maybe about a dozen or so of these kind of virtual installations, I started thinking about what the next stage would be. And I guess the line of work that would eventually become what I slightly kind of、uh, pretentiously call the Sino Futures trilogy started from this line of inquiry, not just like how do these. Locations become a different kind of place with the advent of the virtual and so on. But essentially, how do I become a different kind of person when I engage with these practices? And of course, you know, many many different writers, artists, and people are、uh, thinking and nav、uh, about how to navigate this divide between the, you know, virtual self and the real self, if such a distinction can be said to be made.、Um, but Whereas before I had never been that interested in questions of、uh, identity, so my question with bonus levels was not so much like who am I, but more where am I, and that where am I would essentially determine the kind of persona that I would assume. So in the case of a lot of these virtual worlds, because it was a first-person perspective. And you know this this idea of embodiment that you get with a first person perspective in video games, and to a lesser extent with、um, you know steady cam shots in cinema or the first person voice in literature.、Um, I started thinking like, hang on, as I'm building these places, and I'm also thinking forward, thinking like cinematic cinematographically how I'm going to navigate them while I'm building them. There's other issues at play here. First off, like Who am I as a viewer? So, with、uh, 
with bonus levels, I thought that, you know, this idea of like a utopian perspective is really to do with access. Where's the privileged access to parts of the city that I can reach? And this is, of course, some of the, um, you know, what makes playing video games interesting. It's this new, you know, the suspension of disbelief, the suspension of rules, this new kind of arbitrary goal to perform a task or to just explore that obviously real life with its disciplinary measures and so on doesn't allow us to do. It has a certain kind of freedom and rules at the same time, which is, you know, the paradox of any kind of game or ludic space. So cut a long story short, um, I started thinking, okay, if I'm going to take myself out of this context of having to have these exhibitions within a certain way of earning a living, essentially, where would I place this, um, you know, where would I place my camera, so to speak? So uh, my next film that gradually led into Sinofuturism was this um, film Geomancer that, uh, that Gail uh, mentioned at the start. So I thought with some of my work that I'm not gonna show here, like the interesting thing was not just creating a fictional persona but, or a fictional art world, but also creating fictional artists who would inhabit this future art history. And seen from the perspective of say 20, 30 years time, of course, all our present day technology will seem extremely primitive, just like whatever, you know, landlines, non HD monitors, you know, computers with valves and, you know, propeller airplanes. Um, so I thought, what if we could take this lens of the future, use it to reflect back on the present? Um, the more I started thinking about this, I realized how much my own subjective um, uh, impressions of reality are as much shaped by, you know, my, my consumption of media, of course. So how much, for example, was, I, was my experience of growing up in Southeast Asia and Hong Kong and so on, colored by watching it again through the lens, through the romantic artful lens of Wong Kar Wai's filmmaking, Christopher Doyle's cinematography, and you know this grand romantic music, I had become nostalgic towards a past that was never there. And of course, this exact same process happens in very, uh, you know, in just normal stuff you like or the music that you grew up listening to, as much as in uh, kind of like reactionary politics. There's always this appeal to the past that is as fictive as it might be imaginary, which is also, of course, a problem with them. The uh, you know. I guess, politics that uses utopianism as a kind of premise. So anyway, I thought, what if I set the next film, Geomancer, in a place I know very well growing up in, which is Singapore? Um, of course, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that my own impressions of Singapore as a small Southeast Asian island nation, post-colonial British, majority Chinese, um, quite wealthy in first world by some measures, but not in others. How much of that had been colored by uh, impressions from the West, essentially, um, most famously, at least it used to be, um, William Gibson's Disneyland with the Death Penalty, which was an essay that he wrote in the first year of Wired magazine, actually. I think it must have been uh, something April 20, uh, 1993, when I was actually living in Singapore at the time as a kid. So the landscape he's describing, I remember as a child. In the essay, which you can still find online on Wired magazine and their archive, projects a, well, Disneyland with the death penalty says it all. It projects a kind of vision of complete fakery on a country at the time, which had, I think, about 3 million people. Um, and of course, there's this vision of Singapore as a um, as a authoritarian nation state with a strange hybrid of, let's say, a Confucian control society that we can see how it's portrayed in terms of the measures taken to combat coronavirus and how that's portrayed from a um, privacy loving media, let's say, um, versus the impression that because somewhere was like a Disneyland, which also had a death penalty for drug, drug trafficking, for example, it's actually reading it now seems a slightly biased viewpoint. 
Um, there's another essay by Rem Koolhaas in his, the architect Rem Koolhaas in his book, SMLXL, that also talks about Singapore as this, um, uh, how should I say, like prototype city state if you wanted to create the perfect conditions for a kind of governed, digitally governed surveillance society. Anyway, I thought looking more deeply into this and about my own biases in this, I saw that there might be a way of kind of turning this on its, on its head somewhat to think that actually if how Singapore is portrayed is essentially as a robot machine state, rather than trying to turn myself back into this humanist viewpoint of seeing like how liberalism should be implemented overseas, I actually thought, how could empathy with the machine be generated? So this was a first of a long line of inquiry that led to the video essay, Sinofuturism, um, and the kind of works in the second third of the screen um, that I'm sharing. In Sinofuturism, which was actually made as a video essay while I was researching the script for Geomancer, I kind of started observing, starting from William Gibson, um, a lot of parallels between the positive and negative portrayals of kind of China and its industrialization. I'm just gonna let it play to have something to talk over here. Um, the opening shot, this is kind of like director's commentary here. Uh, the opening shot is actually from 2046 as well. And in here, I believe this is a cyborg talking into this gramophone horn to kind of cast their memories back to, because they're sitting on this train seeking to reclaim lost memories, basically. So I started noticing that, you know, Chinese industrialization and AI were being discussed in exactly the same way, in the sense that it could either be a kind of say, uh, they could either, you know, China could save capitalism for its, from itself, AIs could save humanity for itself, so that's a positive light, or it could also be, you know, the one thing that ends human history as we know it, like, you know, the kind of uh, China versus America competition with super superpower dynamics, or that um, AI could also beat humanity. Uh, so I started these seeing these parallels between basically portrayals of Chinese industrialization and portrayals of artificial intelligence. And I think Sinofuturism, because as a word, it is essentially quite polemic, I think it created some you know, this is just my kind of interpretation of it, which is essentially this conspiracy theory that isn't it funny how China, Chinese industrialization and technology and AI, AI development share exactly the same defining characteristics. Those of you may remember that in, uh, in 2016, there was, a, uh, there was a game of Go between Google DeepMind's Go playing AI AlphaGo and Korean Go champion Lee Sedol. Um, and in this, basically, uh, AlphaGo beat Lee Sedol by four games to one. And so this was seen by many kind of AI commentators as a, the ultimate demonstration that even the most uh, cognitively complex human game, there's some exceptions, but board game at least, um, you know, the human would lose to the go, um, the Google's DeepMind AI, which was, and this was seen as a seminal turning point, you know, turn, going back to Gary Kasparov learn, uh, losing against Deep Blue and so on in chess, that kind of show that, you know, the AI will essentially dominate. Um, so Sinofuturism takes this historical moment, I guess, as a starting point to look backwards in time and forwards in time to think about the different, you know, mirror images of these portrayals and how, and how complex they are essentially. So the video essay itself is called Sinofuturism 1839 to 2046. Why 1839? Because it's the year of the first, uh, the year, the first year of the first opium war between Great Britain and China. And why 2046? Because that's the Wong Kar Wai film, uh, the name of the Wong Kar Wai film. But also the reason that the Wong Kar Wai film is called 2046 is that it's the last year before Hong Kong reverts back to um, uh, Chinese government state laws, basically, because there's a kind of 50 year period with um, 
one one nation, two systems rule essentially. So from 1997, Hong Kong's handover back to China from the um, as a British colony to 2047, 2046. That's a 50 year time span that is meant to be this ticking ticking clock of freedom essentially. So what I thought was interesting with this kind of temporality of Chinese or Sino-Futurism is that it's kind of overshadowed both by the kind of shame of the opium war and losing out, so goes the narrative, losing out to like Western powers and so on. And it's also overshadowed by the future, you know, this idea that what if freedom or, you know, this kind of uh, potent Hong Kong's neoliberal potential to bring freedom into that part of the world fails. So in kind of formulating this idea of futurism, I was talking to some friends who also, you know, engaged with movements in Afrofuturism and Gulf futurism and thinking about what an appropriate avatar would be for Sinofuturism. And of course, I realized that for Sinofuturism, the ultimate avatar basically is the AI because the AI, much like the Chinese workforce is capable of endless work for very little pay, uh, capable of uh, consuming huge amounts of data and copying things without much scope for originality, um, conditioned to learn in a way that will only, um, that is only as a productive mechanism. So whether it's, you know, representations of Foxconn factory workers making everyone's iPhone or robots lined up in the marketplace, the representation between human and machine is very, is very similar. Um, and so with this in mind, I started thinking, basically the idea of not just in what ways is, are we anthropomorphizing the robot or the cyborg, which we see a lot obviously in films like Blade Runner and Her and so on. I started thinking, what if it's actually the other way around? So I'm just gonna play the, um, the trailer from Geomancer, which essentially sketches out the, the premise. It's kind of um, portrait of the artist as a young AI. 你知道看到每一波浪每一只鸟每一个动物和水面上反射着碎成意外片的阳光是什么样的吗要看穿水直到鲸鱼都不敢游泳的深度而且不仅仅是看还要记住一切把每个细节着合成神经网络我会是雕塑家。如果我有声音，我会歌唱；如果我有灵魂，我会祈祷。但是我只有心灵的眼睛，所以我梦想世界。So I guess a really important question in all of this as well is that you know, in what way does sorry, in what way do representations of Chinese technology color our perceptions of how that might be represented artistically? In other words, is this not just what, you know, um, is known as techno-orientalism through, you know, smoke and mirrors, essentially? I think, you know, it's, it's a very interesting point as, you know, uh, for example, Hollywood and TV shows grapple with the idea of how do you make faithful adaptations of, let's say, anime series or Asian characters while glossing over very important cultural differences. I don't think I have any real opinions. I mean, I have real opinions on that, but I don't have any conclusions to that. But all I know from working around the subject for a long time is that the more I research 
ideas about non-human intelligence and AI, the more I actually think to myself, hang on, in which ways is my thinking algorithmic? Not so much, am I anthropomorphizing the cyborg? You know, am I just wanting to project my own human fantasies onto the machine? But actually, in what ways is my own mind essentially a self a self-optimizing system for maximizing my potential in the world, you know, if you had to describe um, human life in, 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 as this kind of horrific algorithm. Um, and to go further down this rabbit hole of complicating the relationship between my subjectivity and the work I'm making, I also started thinking, hang on, so I've created like a fictional AI artist in this future plausible world of Singapore in 2065. In this scenario, in which fiction and reality become very blurred, the AIs in the film Geomancer would have watched their, would have watched my 2016 video essay, Sign of Futurism. And they might have been like, oh, look, finally, someone who takes AIs seriously, not just as a kind of labor producing subject, but actually as a kind of um, genuine, uh, a genuine agent, I suppose, you know, with agency, maybe rights, maybe a certain kind of idea of autonomy and so on. So um, I'm going to play this silently. So the next project really was sometimes, like I was saying, I have a video game that turns into a film. And in this case, I had a film that morphed into this conspiracy theory video essay that then became this ongoing video game called 2065. And in 2065, actually, some of the ideas of site-specific came back. So 2065 is a video game made by Farsight Corporation, who is also the developers of the AI in the film Geomancer. Um, they have made a video game and they've basically rented out a gallery space in Hong Kong called K11 to exhibit their new video game, much like whatever Microsoft might take over the ground floor of a shopping mall or, you know, Sony PlayStation takes over the airport for like a product launch or so on. The difference here I was thinking is instead of myself being, you know, artist, capital A, name on the front door, what if I was a content creator for this um, Farsight Corporation? So in a sense, what if I take the fictional timeline of Geomancer and actually try and think about in which ways am I, am I just uh, realizing the timeline from the fiction in the film itself. Um, and the narrative of the game is essentially this group of AIs have created a video game for Farsight. Instead of just being confined to playing games, now the AIs are creating the games as well. Um, and of course, to the human observer, it's kind of ambiguous whether how much control or agency you have within the framework of the game. Um, as you can see, it's also set within the same Marina Bay, uh, Marina Bay area of Singapore. And so that this video game 2065 also became an archive of the different places where it was exhibited. So most recently, and this is kind of funny, is um, was at the last year's um, Singapore Biennial. So where it's so this was, I think, about a year and a half after the exhibition in Hong Kong. And of course, here we have the great um, you know, collision of artistic project and actual interactive exhibition. In here, there's a group of school children on a tour through the site as well. And the idea of like having this open world video game, oh, this kid's my favorite, he's, he's charging his phone. Uh, instead of plugging in the gamepad. And I think this kid really likes just getting really dizzy looking around. But somehow bleeding over this kind of future game into the present moment somehow in a way that wasn't, that was essentially divorced from the frame of having it within an art gallery exhibition or within a, you know, a stage theater kind of setting was kind of interesting just to see 
you know, how complicated it is, is as well, like not just taking things out of the context of reality, but putting them back in a different way. And this way of uh, kind of producing is something I'm still kind of engaged with at the moment. Like the, one of the other films, uh, the final film in the so-called Sino-Futurist trilogy is um, Idol, which looks at AI and algorithmic development, not just from the perspective of an artist, but also from the, the music industry. And what my interest is in the music industry, not just as a musician, but also as a kind of fan and I guess um, someone interested in the so socioeconomics of the industry is how the music industry is, in my opinion, always one of the first to adopt distribution technologies, not just with you know recording and wax cylinders, tapes, CDs, file sharing systems, torrents, algorithmic streaming, but it's also one that kind of embodies a certain uh, global economic worldview, essentially, that we kind of know as pop, right? So pop music is not just a globalized product that's very kind of standardized and goes viral, but it's also something that has, you know, someone's very kind of true subjective emotions into it. So whereas Geomancer was really looking at the, um, at the way that computer vision and AI might affect how a future artist sees the world. I was thinking with Idol, <clears throat> if how, you know, what Geomancer is to vision, Idol is to music essentially. And in the film, a fading superstar recruits an AI ghostwriter to ghostwrite her new stream of hits. And when I was researching AI, uh, AI generated music, it became really interesting in that even though of course there's lots of really sublime potential in computer generated music and of course many human musicians use generative music or minimalist generative principles in making their work. It also seemed that the actual use of AI in sound is really banal, you know, it's just like um, trying to create copyright free music that sounds generic for, you know, people's ads or startups. And it's also about creating endless streams so that people don't stop listening to Spotify or whatever streaming service that they're interested in. So I thought of having Idol as embodying both the like geopolitical um, frameworks of pop music, as well as its kind of experiential qualities and also thinking about how influencer culture might evolve in future. Diva 转向力在四十年代的时候我每晚都去我在那儿遇到了所有的明星制片人和设计师这是我全部的生命
So Idol is essentially set the week after Geomancer, so it's you know the direct sequel to it. And so Singapore is set in, uh, sorry, Geomancer is set in Singapore, and Idol is set in peninsula in, in Malaysia, which is you know a kind of peninsula just north of the island of Singapore, and. I was interested in kind of colliding a few different both futures and histories in the jungle setting, um, you know, kind of extending on from sign of futurism somewhat. I was also thinking in which ways my understanding, I guess my cinematic understanding of the jungle actually is essentially just as um, media saturated as my idea of, you know, futuristic cityscape, even though I know the actual physical location quite well. Because of course, you know, for me, I started thinking, what are my um, existing frameworks of the jungle, right? So, and they're kind of either very exoticized or very simplistic, you know? So you might have whatever, like Werner Herzog, Fitzcarraldo or Algria, um, you know, this kind of heart, entering into the heart of darkness, the great unknown, which is the hostile jungle. That's one paradigm. And the other one is, I mean, basically Vietnam War films. So, of course, many filmmakers and people are dealing with the aesthetic of the jungle, but I thought with Idol, since it's set in Malaysia, I was kind of bringing together a historic group. I mean, uh, a historic group, the resist Malaysian Communist Party during the 1950s, as 1950s, who were essentially the anti-colonial forces. Um, and kind of juxtaposing that idea of this communist force in the jungle with the AIs in Idol, who also are kind of competing against the humans in this video game called Call of Beauty, which is the esports game that they're playing in the trailer. Um, so even though some of these histories are really kind of buried deep within there, I'm also interested in, I guess, reformulating them in a way that isn't super straightforward or didactic like it might be in a kind of um video essay in the same in the same sense so the last project in this kind of sino-futurist universe I'll, I'll talk about is temple um which kind of brings us back to you know reality and back to london as at the start really so as we could see in in idol which takes place in 2065 at the end, the singer is talking about this club that she used to go to called Temple. So rewinding back some time, uh, I started making essentially a soundtrack because sometimes I release the soundtracks after they've been in the films to make a, a kind of project called Temple, which is basically about um, Diva's disused club. And in this, Basically, it's again in this slightly post-apocalyptic wasteland, which may or may not be London today, in which I'm just thinking about the ways in which now, eerily enough, these empty landscapes for a small amount of time became urban reality. And somehow, I guess, that those empty landscapes that I had made, essentially because of my own technical limitations, then became in a way like observational documentaries of a London that was going to come. So I'm just going to play a bit of a first track from this album called Temple here. Time. Bathed in the harsh light of the sun. Dunes stretch out in front of you. In the center is a familiar object. A London underground train carriage lies on the crest of the dune. Like a beached whale in the desert. It doesn't belong here. And neither do you. The train is burning up. Smoke is pouring out from the inside. Above the driver's car is the sign, for the train's destination. Temple. You approach slowly. Gliding. Tracking. Towards the flames. The doors don't open. They're closed tight to keep the sand out. When I was in my prime, I flourished like 
The gardener standing by three offers he made to You see the train is in front of a station. It's temple. The station is abandoned but illuminated. The last person out forgot to turn off the light. sometimes the loops kind of recur in a way that I don't anticipate. You know, sometimes it's because of the medium. I start with a video game, soundtrack comes, and then the film does. And then iteratively, it kind of keeps on morphing and evolving to other things. But I think in, you know, this current film that I'm working on and so on, I'm thinking of not so much like setting it in, you know, a few decades in the, in the, fut in the future, but more this kind of like, in the near future or in the short term horizon and as different elements you know interact with each other in you know in ways that i kind of uh can't really anticipate so this kind of sino-futurist strain i guess of the things that i've been interested in you know keep on coming back sometimes obviously with you know real world events but i'm always interested in thinking how they might uh, keep on evolving in the future so that's my talk. Thank you very much. Awesome. Um, I'm sure there's thunderous applause for you all over the world right now <laughs> that we can't hear. Um, but thank you so much for that amazing talk. And I'm going to ask, uh, I think, a few of my own questions and give people a chance to type some questions into the Q&A box. So please, um, audience members, as you think of questions to ask Lawrence, please type them in and I'll read some of them off in just a moment. Um, I love that video you took of the exhibit of um, 2065 in the gallery space because the way you're holding the camera and approaching the, the audience members was a lot like the way Geomancer floats through the casino. So it's like, I'm very familiar with Geomancer's POV now. And for a moment, I was like, are these people rendered or are they recorded? Um, and they were recorded. So it was 
is awesome. Uh, and I've been pronouncing idol wrong this whole time. I've been pronouncing no it way. like it's fine. Oh, but of course it's idol, like K-pop idol. So that's so great. I thought we would start off just by asking you to define Sinofuturism for us. Um, Sinofuturism, you say in the in the first piece, which is a video essay, uh, you say Sinofuturism has uh, seven guiding principles that embrace the key stereotypes associated with China. And I'll just read them off. The seven guiding principles of Sinofuturism are computing, copying, gaming, studying, addiction, labor, and gambling. So what is Sinofuturism? You associate it in that piece with Afrofuturism. You also in this talk mentioned Gulf Futurism. Um, is Sinofuturism, it's more than predicting the future of Chinese or um, Asian culture. Uh, you know, it's more than sort of like speculating where China and the Chinese diaspora might go. What is Sinofuturism? Um, so, I mean, I can only talk about my interpretation of it. So I think, I mean, it's one of these things that, you know, um, so first is, you know, disclaimer, it's my own subjective opinion on this, and it's just my interpretation. But those particular key stereotypes, I think, computing, copying, gaming, studying addiction, labor, and gambling, to me, it's, I made it in the first place, I guess, to fulfill a need, which was, I didn't, it didn't ex exist, which was kind of really perverse, I think. So even, and not to say that, of course, there's not people dealing with this from inside, outside China, Chinese, non-Chinese, and so on. It's just that it hadn't been talked about in the same kind of actually exhaustive detail as Afrofuturism and Gulf Futurism, which was kind of ironic in that in the real world news, Chinese industrialization, China and technology are incredibly present. However, in the kind of cultural context, and of course, I know you co-edited a book, Techno-Orientalism, it didn't exist in the same framework of, um, I guess, like, to be honest, like subversive playfulness, right? So that some proponents of, you know, Gulf futurism or Afrofuturism or, you know, like newer interpretations of Afrofuturism, like Martin Sims's, you know, mundane Afrofuturist mm. manifesto, which kind of plays with the kind of over serious, um, tropes, I guess, of a lot of futurisms. And of course, Italian futurism is incredibly like macho, heroic, violent, and, you know, pro-technology. Um, and, you know, essentially embracing it when technology is, you know, killing untold numbers of people, especially during the First World War. So the irony there of um, violence and technology or futurity wasn't just the only um, topic. For me, it was a natural outgrowth of my own observation. So I kind of saw it as like a, actually kind of making a documentary and my source material for making the documentary was Googling on the internet. So I just Googled China AI, China technology, Chinese development, and like literally these 90% of the videos that I'm using in the, in the kind of collage of the essay just came from Googling China AI and Chinese technology in circa 2016. And so you would get, um, you know, uh, Infowars segments just as much as you might get New York Times mini documentary think pieces about, you know, internet addiction in China. And, you know, this kind of like heartwarming stories of, you know, Chinese kids studying and at the same time, in the next link below, you would get, you know, a kind of Breitbart style, um, you know, anti anti China rant. But what was interesting is that, in relation to the next question, which is, what is Sino Futurism? Is it Orientalism? Um, I mean, and I'm kind of talking about that there. But one of the big ironies I also thought, as a kind of a diaspora ch um, Chinese person, is that some of the, let's say, biggest um, Chinese chauvinists are people, how should I say, overseas Chinese who, ne who don't live there. Because of course, quite often, emigrant cultures preserve the old traditions even more strongly than the original 
people in the original place. In the case of China, quite often that's through um, <clears throat> cultural revolution and you know actual initiatives to you know reset culture. So sometimes, especially in you know Southeast Asia, Singapore, Malaysia, Chinese in Indonesia, and so on, um, many traditions exactly this you know computing, copying, gaming, addiction, labor, and gambling are those principles. They're not even just um, I guess somehow it seems that the, just my understanding was that the emigration and kind of diaspora culture brings certain things up to the forefront as, you know, essentially life livelihood gets harder, especially because, you know, immigrants, especially at, that, at those times and now have essentially fewer rights, rights of migration and, you know, legal rights and so on, and obviously less money. They are more susceptible to these systems of you know labor subjected to addiction and gambling so i just thought of it as they were essentially the th first things that came to mind which was also reinforced by the material i found in my kind of you know internet research basically awesome great thank you um i'm gonna think about sinofuturism for a long time to come uh, and I feel like every time you say something about it, I just have more questions, but I'm going to move on because we have so many great questions from the audience. One person <clears throat> asks, uh, there's a sense of longing in idol and temple. Um, have you considered how emotion enters AI uh, and your embodied algorithmic agents in your works? I also made a note of that, how your AIs are so emotional. They're such feeling beings. They're full of memories and grief. Um, they have this hard won wisdom. They have hopes for the future. They have dreams for their youth. They talk about generations of each other, uh, how the young AIs are different than the older ones. And um, yeah, what are, you, what are you giving us by giving us such deeply feeling AIs? You know, um, I think what's interesting in, in I mean, I guess when you look at a lot of AI development research and neuroscientific research, because, you know, the idea of, so there's the engineering principles and there's artistic interpretations, right? So in terms of engineering principles of AI, um, there are many different theories of like how we might arrive at a greater than human intelligence. One of them, for example, is whole brain emulation, where essentially you just cut up a human brain into many th tiny slices and recreate that digitally. And so you would have a map of a human brain that supposedly would have consciousness and so on. Um, a huge part of obviously, um, and, and also in different so spheres of philosophy of mind, there's like so-called the brain and vat experiment. The brain and vat experiment is essentially, you know, the matrix question of how do you know that you are not a brain in a vat being fed sensory information that you think is real? Um, so all of these different theories of what a mind is, notwithstanding, I feel what is, what draws me to work in general, I mean, any kind of artwork or thing I like, is the dimensions that are not so easily rationally explained. So, um, I think psychologists and neuroscientists, like, often think, you know, what is emotion? What is the function of emotion in the human animal? It is to... Um, what is it? Very often it's to give us reward mechanisms for desired behavior. Like what is love? Is it, you know, for social dynamics to create greater chances of survival amongst the species? Yes. Um, you know, what is fear? It is to also increase chances of survival in the kind of um, that part of the brain. And also emotion, so they say, emerges at a more, how should I say, not essentially more primitive part of the brain, you know, the limbic um, medulla reptile brain, whereas, you know, the higher linguistic functions happen, happen, you know, the frontal cortex. So somehow emotion is more basic in a sense than uh, mm. being able to articulate things in language. So of course, I have no idea about the future AI or anything like this. But what I was thinking is that if you had a similar idea of, you know, you have the cognition, you have the reasoning, 
teleological, what am I here for? What's my prime directive or whatever? That is so often the portrayal of AIs in films, right? I have four years left to live. I must live longer. I must, you know, not harm humans, all this kind of thing. It's like rule-based systems that of course, you know, and the argument is that because AIs are algorithms, they have to obey these rules. My interest, however, is in the, I guess, non-linguistic forms of being that I would imagine also come to um, govern an AI's consciousness. And by AI, I mean a, a mind with bodily senses and some idea of co connection to others, like other generations and the environment, you know, so they are like a sensory being as much as a being with memory. And much like many of human emotions, they're very hard to articulate. And so I don't think it's, for me, it's not anthropomorphizing the AI. It's just a way to get at all of the other, um, impos frankly, impossible to quantify things that are uh, a way of being in, in, in the world, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're saying it's more basic. The AIs can learn it. They, they can learn emotion because they know, I mean, Geomancer reads all of human history, everything that's ever been printed by humanity. I mean, are, are you saying that, you know, it's not that hard for Geomancer to become a feeling being because uh, she can process everything that humans have put out and it's obvious emotion is key to all of that. Yeah, I feel even whether it's the emotion is through mimicking what they learn, or whether the emotion is something kind of like implicit or self-generated. I think what's interesting is that it would be impossible to tell, you know, not like in a kind of emotional Turing test kind of way, you know, is the emotion you're feeling real? And of course in, you know, psychological studies of this, it's like humans can enter into a state of anger by thinking angry things. I mean, and then you get a physiological, um, you know, hormonal response essentially. And of course with the AI it would be different, but what I'm saying is it would be very difficult to distinguish. Um, and yeah. I mean, I imagine it would be difficult to distinguish. Um, and, but of course the questions of, you know, like truth and trust for AI is that's, that's definitely not gonna be the first thing that um, is, is an issue. I think it would be much more to do with, you know, like verifying true statements in a rule-based logic kind of way. But that's, I guess, my brief experiments of forays into actually learning about machine learning have taught me not that much, but enough to know that no one really knows. So mm -hmm. conjecture is like a huge part of um, current machine learning research, which is, you know, apparently some computer scientists say it's not science because it's essentially trial and error. Therefore, that's in the realm of engineering because these principles that current deep learning um, is based on, essentially no one is, is that sure about how it works, you know? We're kind of sure, but unlike, you know, the, it's, it's essentially hypothetical, but it's engineering because um, it's just shown that it kind of works. And so that's why we get into uh, problems with, you know, black box AI, machine explainability, which a lot of people say is the next stage of um, actually leading to uh, you know, machinic governance or automated scary things like automated law and things like that. Like essentially how do we deconstruct the decision-making process that a human could tell you, they might be lying, but they could you know, make up some idea on the spot. Whereas very often the kind of deep learning algorithms you know, spit out an answer um, based on how they're made. And yet, you know, your AI are not scary in uh, in your pieces. They're the heroes. Uh, they are wholly unconcerned with how they learn to feel and remember and hope and dream and and want to be artists, um, want to be creators and makers. Uh, you know, if anything, Farsight seems like the villain of the piece. Uh, Farsight, whose motto is aligning AI with human interests. 
Um, I love that motto. I mean, in a kind of, I hate, love it. And then, um, you know, the bi there's a war in, in Idol between, or there's a competition maybe is a better term between the bios and the synths, between um, humans who I think want to be maybe only human and um, the synthetic beings. And, the, and there are these bio supremacists whose motto is only human. Um, which is another great motto. And if anything, those those two factions seem to be somewhat opposed to each other and also maybe the villains of the piece as opposed to the AIs that, that you ask us to identify with. Um, so you can tell me later if you think if you think th they are the villains. Um, but you know, in terms of uh, what you're asking of us, that's another question from the audience is what kind of mode of reception are you, are you at, are you calling for through your works? Because um, this person, it's actually one of my students, Caleb says, uh, you know, there's a kind of uh, rapidness to the pacing of your works that is, um, it's too quick to actually sort of make sense of it. It's more dreamlike or more video game like. Um, and there's this unfocused way of watching that he finds himself in, um, sort of, you know, zoning out, playing, detaching, which is typical of the, of internet surfing. Uh, and so the, the question is, is this, are you deliberately trying for that mode of reception? Are you trying to call upon your audience to occupy a certain frame of mind that's closer to long hours of gaming or surfing the web or something like that rather than you know engaging with film and narrative and character yeah sure i mean i think i i mean frankly i don't really have any control on how anyone watches anything so you know even thinking that the closest the closest that you can hope for is a film screening that starts at 9 p.m. sharp and you don't leave till an hour and a half later. So the span, the attention, the attention, basically the temp, the time attention span of different works happens at different times. So for example, the video game is meant to be looped. It doesn't really start at any point. It doesn't really end at any point. There's no goals or kind of situations with that. There's the short film, which is essentially like the trailer where you're trying to like compress all of these ideas into something that you're, what you're asking for is investment of time, right? So in a weird way, like there is the cinematic expectation where it starts at the beginning and it ends at the end. And, you know, the narrative arc, character development, you know, plot points and, you know, resolution and climax and all that stuff. To some extent, you know, follow the, the filmmaking idea of, you know, dramatic rise, fall and resolution. And some of mine are kind of vaguely modeled on that. Like stuff happens, it's a journey. But the, what I'm trying to do in general, whether that's the music, which is, is it ambient, is it dance, like whatever, or with the films, is it a video game? Is it a trailer? Is it all the cutscenes from a video game with the playable bits taken out? Um, it's kind of, I haven't really, you know, made a firm decision, but I think the idea in general is that I'm thinking of like, what is the idea of like a road movie, I guess, you know, the, the, meandering narrative where like nothing happens or it's you know the, the film that where nothing happens that I find is kind of interesting I mean you also get many games where like it's the game where you don't have to do anything you know it's the ambient game it's a walking simulator that I find quite interesting because of course they still obey this like you know what happens at the end but um in terms of attention I think there is what I was kind of interested in doing is kind of like, I guess, ambient music in a sense. Like if you take out all the, the highs and lows of kind of, let's say orchestral music, what, do you, what are you left with? So with the games, it's kind of, if you take away the, the goals and endpoints, what are you left with? You're a wandering simulator. And also with the, I guess, more film-like things, if you take away the, the 
need to fulfill the narrative arc, what do you end with? So in Idol, for example, it's kind of also because the film is about the making of the, um, the film is about the making of the album. So it's also ambiguous whether the whole film is essentially a promo video for the whole album to be released, or if it's actually like serves that, you know, rise and fall, because it does obey that rise and fall narrative or rather like fall than rise. Um, but at the same time, it's literally divided into 30, you know, chapters um, and to release the soundtrack, which ironically enough is happening as well. So I'm just also interested in this time, uh, different kind of like way that time comes back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to hear you talk about like ambient, you know, wandering through worlds. Um, when, you know, Geomancer is a Bildungsroman, it is the coming of age story of an AI. And Idol is a competition story. The, the bios and the synths compete. The final game is at the end and the synths win by, you know, a mile. And Diva is competing against herself. She's trying to write a song that's good enough for Farsight, I think, whoever's paying her um, to write the esports finale song. And um, in the end, she finds that it's worthwhile to cooperate with AI. She has kind of her answer to the competition against herself is to employ the AI, which is, you know, exactly the opposite outcome from the esports finale where the bios play against the sense. So she ends up in this like symbiotic relationship with the AI, learns how to copy herself better than she could have on her own. And it sounds just like everything else and that's perfect. And that's kind of the, the positive judgment of her, of her self copying quest, um, which I love. It's like recursive and forward progress all at the same time. So I think there's a lot of plot in, uh, in, your, in your pieces, um, but I agree that you can also watch it in a very lo-fi um, chill hop kind of way. Um, just as a final question, and I'm sorry to the audience, we might go a little bit over, but um, actually the first question we got, which was in the chat, is how did you find your artistic niche? What has supported you through the process? Um, so I know people are curious, you know, we have a lot of students here tonight, uh, are curious about just how you started to work on this stuff and what, where did you find your encouragement and how did you know you're on the right track? So can you tell our students a little bit about career building in the art world? Yeah, sure. I guess it's um, it's like intuitive, I guess. Um, so I think it starts, so there's many kind of like, mm, I, yeah, like ironic things is that like when you have an idea of what you're going for, essentially like, you know, reality is, it's like a moving target, right? You like, even me like watching now all of these things, some of which are what, like seven years old and some of which are like about a year old. The kind of crazy thing is, and this I think applies to anything working in technology, is that like mm, anything, things look old very quickly. I mean, imagine, you know, looking at a snapshot of social media from three years ago, you know, this slight tiny changes, like the icons are a little bit different, the length, the font, you know, the CSS is a bit strange. So what I'm trying to say is that like, I think you can only do like don't think too much about the future or like kind of direction. I think the first step is earning a living and you know having a small setup to do the work. And for me, I'm quite like, I mean, especially now, I'm quite like a late late night last last minute person. And that's got like slightly better. But the only thing that help me is just like seeking out not even opportunities just like deadlines because you know I think many creative people are complete perfectionists especially you know writers or musicians because and and filmmakers I think it's actually harder to work in like time-based stuff and be a perfectionist because every time you re-listen to something you re-watch something you read re you read something again it's like changed in your head so sometimes that moving target then becomes your opinion of your own work, which means that it never ends up being done. Of course, the opposite problem is just putting out a lot of stuff that's not very good. But what I mean is, I think now my, 
my impression is now that it's really about a balance of um, trying to do things often enough so that you complete things with like mini deadlines, but not getting too sucked in to a like vortex of production. So for example, I make a look, you know, I'm joking about, oh, am I just a content creator for creative industries? And yeah, like hell I am. But I think now, like I was saying earlier, that I see that, you know, small bits of attention are being eaten away. And, you know, the idea of work has become even more like atomized or like, you know, who cares about a feature film? Just give us like 25 seconds in a square format or whatever. I think it's um, somehow about finding, not about, actually, I think niche is the wrong word. I think it's, it, it, it might help if you have a very specific market in mind, right? Because it's, you know, very kind of like, you know, startup idea of I'm doing whatever, you know, tortoise shell sunglasses made in wherever. Um, but the best way I would say is like, I think it's good to find your own rhythm of doing things. And I think once you have the rhythm of doing things, like whether that's doing something every few weeks or every few months, that that is kind of the way I think about it. Because, you know, talking back about like architecture and music, architecture has incredibly long rhythms. It's like 10 years and sometimes it doesn't even happen. Whereas, you know, when I started doing music, it would be like, you know, kind of blogs were a thing. So you do something every couple of months, um, you know, long enough to do something that you're happy with, but not an insane amount of time. And then you would get into this rhythm of, um, just seeing the change over the period of a year, I guess that's really crucial. So yeah, that like finding the right rhythm that works for, for you is I think the important thing. And what doesn't help is it's totally different for everyone and for like different art forms as well, like totally different. So, you know, what works for like a net artist or someone working with websites and, you know, someone working with printed words or performances is different. Um, but I think it's, uh, yeah, that's all I'd say. Whatever the time scale is of whatever particular medium or, or genre people are working in, what is it to get caught in the vortex of production? I feel like I've found, I found myself there, but I'm just curious if you could, if you could sort of, you know, what's that feeling with, for you when you get caught in the vortex of production? Um, what does that feel like? How do we know when we're in the vortex? I think hmm, it's when you get you get like a you have a conversation you have a request that um six months ago you would have been super happy with but when you get it you don't really care if that makes sense you know it's kind of like what would have seen like a great opportunity you think you've like outgrown it somehow and I think sometimes that's just it's like, it's like a right you haven't really um, earned yet, basically. So I think, yeah, the vortex happens when you think you feel that you're juggling and you kind of not look down on the things that, you know, before you would have like looked up to, but it's something along those lines, I guess. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. Interesting. Okay. I love the way you put yourself into the fictions um, that you've created uh, tonight in your talk. You said at one point you said, what if I were creating content for Farsight, which is a company that you created and, and kind of made the villain, and then you, and then you employed yourself um, working for Farsight, which I love. I love the thought experiments of your worlds. All right, well, we're out of time. Thank you so, so much for joining us in the wee hours of the morning in London. Thank you to all our audience for hanging out with us tonight. This was so remarkable and I'm so glad to have had this chance um, to bring you into the Berkeley virtual space. Uh, and I hope to meet you in physical fleshly person at some point. So thank you, Lawrence, this was a pleasure. Amazing, thanks so much. And sorry if I didn't get to answer questions, but yeah, thanks for watching so much. Thank awesome. you, good night everyone.